The second topic covered by the second paper of the AQA GCSEs in Chemistry and Combined Science is Organic Chemistry. This contains a lot of content that's only aimed at those taking GCSE Chemistry, or you might call it Triple Science. So this is a separate video covering all of the content for Unit 7. If you're taking Combined Science, you might prefer to look at my summary of the whole of Paper 2, or just keep an eye on the header to see which bits you don't need to know. So this unit starts off by talking all about crude oil. So you need to know that crude oil is a finite resource found in rocks, which means that it's going to run out. And you need to know that it is the remains of an ancient biomass consisting mainly of plankton that was buried in mud. So basically we're talking about lots of lovely sea creatures which died and then sand fell on top of them and turned into rocks. And meanwhile, they turned into fossil fuels like crude oil. It is a mixture of hydrocarbons, which are compounds made out of hydrogen and carbon only. So absolutely nothing else, just hydrogen and carbon. And those hydrocarbons are mainly a type of hydrocarbon called alkanes. Alkanes are an example of a homologous series. So that's a group of compounds that have similar properties because they have the same functional group and the same general formula. So if you're taking combined science, you need to know about alkanes and alkenes. And if you're taking triple science, you're also going to need to know about alcohols, carboxylic acids and esters. So you should be able to name the first four alkanes, which are methane, ethane, propane and butane. I like to remember this with most elephants prefer bacon. They have a general formula of CN H2N plus two. So that N could be any number. Say if I was trying to come up with a formula for a bigger alkane, say octane, which you don't need to be able to name, but they could say to you, ooh, octane has eight carbons in, and you could then look at that formula and say, okay, so eight times two is 16, plus another two is 18. So the formula of octane would be C8H18. Those alkanes have different boiling points depending on their size. The bigger the alkane, the higher the boiling point because the stronger the forces between them are. And this allows them to be separated by fractional distillation, which we met briefly in paper one. Fractional distillation is used to separate liquids according to their boiling point by using evaporation and condensation. It occurs in a fractionating column and that fractionating column will have sort of a furnace at the bottom and that is going to vaporize pretty much every part of the crude oil although we might have a little bit residue or bitumen left over so all of those alkanes are going to be vaporized they're going to turn into gases and then as they rise up the column it's going to get cooler and cooler we sometimes say that there is a temperature gradient up the column and that just means that it's hot at the bottom and cool at the top where it's far away from the furnace. So as those gases rise higher and higher and it gets cooler and cooler, each one of the gases in the mixture is going to eventually reach a point where it's as cool as its boiling point, And then that gas is going to condense and turn back into a liquid and that will allow it to be tapped off. Fractional distillation of crude oil provides the fuels and feedstocks for the petrochemical industry. So that's basically the industry of making car fuels and jet fuels. And they can also be used for making solvents, lubricants, polymers and detergents. Because the forces between those larger alkanes are stronger, those larger alkanes have higher boiling points. They have higher viscosity, which means sort of stickiness. And also they're less flammable. They burn less cleanly and they burn less well. And that makes them less useful as fuels. One of the major uses of alkanes is combusting them as fuels and when we do that we release carbon dioxide and water and we also release energy. So you do need to be able to write balanced symbol equations for this but it is not nearly as hard as it looks. So basically you're going to start off with the formula of an alkane and you're going to add oxygen and we don't know at the start how much oxygen that will be. We know that we're going to make carbon dioxide and we know that we're going to make water. So if I look at my formula of my alkane, I can see that I've got three carbons there. So I'm going to have to have three carbons on the right hand side. So I put a nice big three in front of carbon dioxide. Then I look at hydrogen and on the left, I've got eight hydrogen in my alkane. On the right hand side, I know I'm going to have water and every water molecule will have two hydrogens in it. So I'm going to put half of the number of water molecules compared to the total number of hydrogen I've got on the left because the water molecule has two hydrogens in it. So four times two makes eight and we're all happy. Finally, I'm literally just going to count up the number of oxygen molecules I need. So if I've got three carbon dioxide molecules, I need three oxygen molecules. And if I've got four water molecules, each of which have only got one oxygen atom in, that's another two oxygen in total, which brings me to five oxygen molecules. Now that method will work beautifully if you have an alkane which has an odd number of carbons in it. If you've got an alkane that has an even number of carbons, then when you try to do this, you're actually gonna end up um, needing a half 
number of oxygen molecules and annoyingly even though we do that at A level we definitely can't do it at GCSE. So the trick is as soon as you see it's an even number you put a nice big two in front of it and then from that point onwards everything is the same. So here I've got two lots of butane with carbon four so that means I'm going to need eight carbon dioxide atoms. I've got two lots of butane, so that's 20 hydrogen atoms in total, and therefore I will need 10 water molecules. And then if I count up all the leftover oxygen, I'm going to need 13 oxygen molecules. Now we said that a major use of alkanes is as fuels, and we said that bigger alkanes do not burn very well. So there is a much higher demand for shorter alkanes than there actually is a supply. So we need a way of turning big alkanes into little alkanes, and that way is cracking. So cracking is a process where we turn a big alkane into a smaller alkane and an alkene, or it could be several alkenes, but basically we're going to break it into smaller parts. Now one thing they can ask you to do is to finish off a simple equation, and this can look really intimidating, but it's actually not at all, because we know that conservation of mass is a thing. Now this means that whatever atoms we have at the start, we must have at the end. So say they tell me that C25H52 is cracked, and they tell me that one of the products is C10H22. Well, I'm thinking, how on earth could I possibly know what the other product is? All you need to do is look at how many carbon atoms have I not used yet, how many hydrogen atoms have I not used yet, and then it's pretty obvious that I'm going to make C15H30. There are two ways of cracking that you need to know about. One is catalytic cracking, where we're going to vaporise the large alkane and pass it over a hot zeolite catalyst. And the other one is steam cracking, which is also going to involve a very high temperature. You don't want to be talking about pressure for cracking, you just want to be talking about high temperature and then either a zeolite catalyst or steam. So we just said that cracking would turn a large alkane into a smaller alkane and one or more alkenes. It's not a typo, it is a different kind of molecule. They're still hydrocarbons, but they now have a carbon-carbon double bond in them. They are more reactive than alkanes, and one of the things they will react with is bromine in bromine water. So the classic test for carbon-carbon double bonds or unsaturated bonds is bromine water. So bromine water is orange, and basically what happens is that the bromine in the bromine water will bond with the two carbons that are forming this double bond, and so the bromine kind of won't be in the bromine water anymore, and so the bromine water will stop being orange. We could say it's decolorized, we could say it becomes colorless. You absolutely must not say that it becomes clear, because it is already clear. You can see through it, it's just orange before you start, and colorless when you finish. Now, if you're taking GCSE chemistry or triple science, there are some other details you need to know about alkenes and also about some other organic molecules. So the first thing that you need to know is that alkenes are really useful for making addition polymers. So you should know from paper one that a polymer is a very long chain of repeating units called monomers. And in addition polymerization, what happens is that those polymers form by a double bond breaking in each of the monomers and those monomers joining up. So to use the example here, we have ethene, which is an alkene with a single double bond in it. And the little n that's written on the left hand side of that shows you that there are lots and lots and lots of them. So n could be a really big number, it could be 200, 2000, and there are that many ethene molecules. Now what's going to happen is that that double carbon-carbon bond in the middle of the molecule is going to break open, and that's going to give each of those carbon atoms the ability to make a new bond. So what they do is they kind of reach out the sides and they grab another ethene molecule, which has just broken its double bond, and they all join together in a really, really long chain. So because these polymers are made by adding monomers together, they're known as addition polymers. Plastics are really good examples of these, and you could be asked to name a polymer based on the monomer that it's made from, but this is actually really straightforward. So we've made a polymer out of ethene, therefore it's called polyethene. If you made a polymer out of propene, it will be called polypropene. You kind of get the idea. You should be able to recognise pictures like that and identify that that is a polymer, and you should also be able to look at a picture of a polymer like that and draw the monomer, or look at a picture of the monomer and draw the polymer. There are also three other chemical reactions that you need to know about for alkenes if you're taking triple science. You need to know about hydrogenation, which is where an alkene can react with hydrogen, and that will turn it back into an alkane. This is the process that we use with vegetable oils or olive oil to harden them to make margarine, and it requires a nickel catalyst. So you hopefully know from paper one that lots of transition metals make really good catalysts, and in this example it's nickel that we're going to use. Alkenes will also react with water at relatively high temperature and high pressure, about 300 degrees C and about 60 atmospheric pressures, in the presence of an acid catalyst, and when they do that, they'll produce alcohols. 
finally, you need to know that alkenes will burn in oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water, but with a smoky flame, so they're not as good fuels as alkanes are. We just mentioned alcohol, so here they are. So the functional group for an alcohol is an OH group. Now, some of you might see OH and start thinking hydroxide, but just be really, really aware you only call OH hydroxide when it's an iron. Here, it's not called that. Um, it does have another name, but to be honest, you're probably safer just referring to it as an OH group. So the general formula for an alcohol is CN, H2N plus 1, OH. And the first four, they're named in exactly the same way as the alkanes, only instead of having ane on the end, it has anol. So we have methanol, ethanol, propanol, and butanol. In addition to featuring in alcoholic drinks, well, at least ethanol does, um, they can be used as solvents, so they're really good at dissolving things, particularly non-polar molecules, which wouldn't dissolve well in water. And if you think about ethanol for a second, it can be produced either by the fermentation of sugar by yeast, so that's an example of anaerobic respiration, and it obviously needs to be warm and wet, or it can be produced by the hydration of ethene, which is where you take some ethene and you react it with steam. Now, each of those methods has got advantages and disadvantages. So obviously, if you're producing alcohol using yeast, it's relatively cheap because you can do it at a low temperature and the yeast sort of does all the work for you. But at the same time, at the end, you're gonna get a very impure product. It's still gonna have quite a lot of water in it. It's going to have the actual yeast in it. And so there are going to be extraction steps and they're going to take time and cost you money. On the other hand, hydrating an alkene, well, that's using up valuable alkenes and it takes a lot of energy, so it could be relatively expensive. But at the end of it, you're going to get a much purer product. Alcohols dissolve in water to produce neutral solutions. Now, that can come as a little bit of a surprise to people because, again, they see OH and they think, oh, that makes it an alkali but the OH of an alcohol isn't gonna break off and be an ion, so it's not going to make a solution alkaline. In terms of chemical reactions, alcohols again will burn or combust in oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water. They react with sodium to release hydrogen gas, and you can test for that with your squeaky pop test, where you ignite it and it burns really rapidly and makes a pop sound. And they can be oxidized either by microbes or by chemical oxidizing agents like potassium dichromate or potassium permanganate to make carboxylic acids, which are weak acids. So speaking of carboxylic acids, here they are. They've got the functional group COOH. And as you can see in my little picture there, the carbon is bonded to one of the oxygens by a double bond and the other one by a single bond. The first four carboxylic acids are called methanoic acid, ethanoic acid, propanoic acid, and butanoic acid. And those acids dissolve in water to form weak acids. So that means that they don't fully ionize. So in order to make a solution acidic, the carboxylic acid needs to lose that hydrogen, it needs to allow that hydrogen to be a hydrogen ion. And when we say that they don't fully ionize, what we mean is that actually a lot of those carboxylic acids will hold on to their hydrogen, they won't let go of it. So therefore it kind of can't affect the pH, it can't affect the acidity. Now what that means is that if I take one mole of a strong acid, like hydrochloric acid, and I take one mole of a weak acid, like carboxylic acid, and I dissolve both of those in water, the hydrochloric acid being a strong acid will have a much, much lower pH, it will be much more acidic, because it will give up all of its hydrogen ions whereas the carboxylic acid is still holding on to lots of them, so they're not affecting the pH. If we want to test whether a solution we've got is a carboxylic acid, one way we can do that is to react it with a carbonate, and that will produce some carbon dioxide gas bubbles, which we could test for with lime water. Carboxylic acids also react with alcohols to make esters, which are another homologous series. Esters are sweet-smelling, volatile substances, so they're often used as either perfumes or as flavours, because basically they smell nice, they taste nice, they evaporate really easily. They're made from a condensation reaction between an alcohol and a carboxylic acid. So you can see in my picture here, I've got some methanol and I've also got some propanoic acid. And what's happening is that one of those loses a hydrogen and one of those loses an OH and together that makes a water molecule, hence condensation. And you're going to name those esters based on the name of the alcohol and the name of the carboxylic acid. So here we've got methyl propanoate. We mentioned briefly when talking about alkenes that there were these two kinds of polymerization, and one of those is called addition polymerization, because within GCSE we are only going to meet addition polymers that have a double bond in the middle of them. Now there's a couple of things to be aware of. One is that you sometimes see people trying to add in lots of extra double bonds, so just remember that your monomer only needs to have one double bond in it, and that may mean that you find it being drawn in a slightly unfamiliar way. So here on the left we've got a molecule that fundamentally starts off as propene, and you would be used to seeing propene drawn in a nice long straight line with three carbons in a row. But to kind of make it easier for us when we start drawing the polymer, here we've drawn it. So we've just got the two carbons with a double bond between them. And then anything else is kind of off on a chain to the top. 
and you can see on the right hand side that means that when we draw it it just makes life a little bit less complicated. The other thing to be aware of is that it's really likely that they might give you a monomer that you have never even heard of but that's fine because all you need to do when naming it is put poly on the front. So this is chloropropene because it has a chlorine atom on the outside of it um, and although you haven't met halogenoalkanes at GCSE you can still name it just as easily because you're just going to put poly on the front and make polychloropropene. You should also be aware that AQA don't just have to draw the polymer with brackets like this, they could give you a full display formula which would look a little bit something like this. So if you're looking at this and you're trying to work out what the monomer is so you can go backwards, you just want to look for wherever it repeats. So here if I look at the top I can see it goes HCH3, HCH3, hydrogen methyl, hydrogen methyl, and on the bottom it's going chlorine, hydrogen, chlorine, hydrogen. So I can see that my repeating unit is sort of two carbons long and based on that I can sort of block that off as one repeating unit and from there I can work my way back to my monomer. The other type of polymerization is condensation polymerization. So here we don't need to have a double bond because that double bond doesn't need to break and join up. What's going to happen instead is that we're going to lose a small molecule and chances are that will be water. So you've already seen one example of a condensation reaction where our ester formed. That's not strictly a polymerization reaction because you've only got two little molecules joining together. But if you had a monomer that had a carboxylic acid group at one end and an alcohol group at the other end, or equally if you have two monomers, one with two carboxylic acid groups and one with two alcohol groups, then you can get a polyester. Another example of condensation polymerization reaction that you might have seen is um, the production of proteins by amino acids joining together. So again, we've got a carboxylic acid group and we've also got a different functional group that includes a hydrogen. So when the OH is lost from the carboxylic acid and the H is lost from the amine group, then we have water being produced and also the two molecules join up together. And that's how proteins form. There are some named examples of polymers that you might have come across. So there's DNA, which you obviously know from biology. So you should know it has a double helix structure and that it's made of four complementary nucleotides. We've just talked about proteins, which are polymers of amino acids, and also you should know from biology about starch, which is a polymer made of glucose.